Hello and welcome to the mini lecture on witchcraft. Well, specifically the Salem witch trials, so not really entirely on witchcraft itself. Now, while it may, while it may be interesting to think about uh, the Salem witch trials as a one-off event, nothing really that had any sort of significance, and just one of these things that, uh, well, well, this happens from time to time, and it's kind of a weird thing for it to... to, to uh, occur, it, it's actually a lot more insidious than that and a lot more pervasive. So normally when you talk about witchcraft and persecution of witches, this is the type of scene that comes to mind, or at least does for me, yeah, you know, being nerdy and all. But it's a lot more complicated than that. Accusations of witchcraft were not new. In January of 1692, 11-year-old Abigail Williams and 9-year-old Betty Paris, the daughter of a minister, began to behave in a peculiar manner. They experienced uncontrollable spasms and twitches and then barked like dogs. Abigail flapped her arms like a bird and said that a witch was trying to get her. Soon, other children began to act in a similar fashion, and thus began one of the more dishonorable episodes in American history. By the time it was all over, 19 men and women, plus two dogs, were executed for witchcraft. Mass hysteria caused another 55 people to repent their sins, while an addition one, additional 130 people awaited trial for witchcraft before the whole episode was ever over. Sorry. One, of the more, uh, one of history's primary functions is to dispel the popular belief that's widely held but factually incorrect. Few subjects are more enveloped in myth than the Salem witch scare. Some of the myths are obviously incorrect. No one in Salem was actually burned at the stake. They were hanged. Um, one person was actually pressed to death. Nor were witchcraft accusations uh, leveled exclusively at women or the elderly or the poor. Fourteen women and five men were hanged. Uh, as I mentioned, one man was pressed to death with heavy stones for refusing to plead guilty or innocent. He actually did. He refused to enter a plea and he was pressed to death. Uh, his final words were more weight. So that's an interesting little tidbit. And other myths deserve a lot more uh, scrutiny. The scare only ended when children accused of governor's uh, accused the governor's wife of witchcraft, and a special grand jury was convened that quickly threw out more than a hundred charges of witchcraft. But there's a bunch of myths. Myth number one: By 1692, almost no education educated people believed in witchcraft. That is false. Even educated people believed that the devil was present. Sir Isaac Newton. You know, the guy who invented a whole new way of uh, dealing with mathematics in order to explain his new theory of gravity. Uh, also wrote extensively on the devil and witchcraft and ghosts. Myth number two, Salem witchcraft uh, scare was a one-of-a-kind incident and an anomaly in the history of New England. Between 1645 and 1663, about 80 people throughout the Massachusetts Bay Colony were accused of practicing witchcraft. Thirteen women and two men were executed. What made the Salem episode unique was not only the number of uh, accusations and the executions, but the fact that the public authorities, who had imposed restraints on witchcraft ac accusations by requiring high levels of evidence, had reduced their standards. <clears throat> they did not require physical evidence against the accused. They allowed spectral evidence, the image that had appeared in the witness's dreams or maybe some sort of uh, vision. Another myth is that the witch trials were confined to a single town. That's not true. Uh, Salem Village was, actually it's been renamed uh, Danvers, and of the 150 people that were formally charged during the crisis, only 24 of them resided actually in Salem vi Village uh, properly. The witchcraft crisis, in fact, enveloped much of Essex County, then, uh, which is the entire northeastern portion of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And more people had been accused of witchcraft in neighboring Andover, Andover, sorry, rather than uh, Salem Town or even Salem Village itself. It's weird the way they have towns and villages with the same type of name. It's uh, just a minor type of thing. Uh, number four, this is one an argument that I get into my wife with a lot, is she's a microbiologist. Uh, and it's that the scare was brought on by the hallucination of a disease or by poisoning. One is that uh, it's um, brought on by a mold that grows on rye, which is called ergot, um, which basically is LSD. Uh, and that's not the case. That would be a nice, simple explanation for it, as people were just 
uh, had some sort of drugs in their system. But that's not the case. It actually grew out of tensions that have been mounting for decades, for generations. Uh, all sorts of things were going on in the environment that made this one of those things that uh, unfortunately eventually happened. You had wealth disparities that were growing. People were changing the way that they made money. People were... Um, <clears throat> were scared, really. Uh, there was a conflict with Indians aligned with the French. You had it was known as King William's War. You also had uh, the fact that uh, Massachusetts Bay was stripped of its original charter. Basically, the entire government system was thrown into disarray. And then the scare was insignificant. That is the final myth. It had no real lasting impact, and it did. Uh, England ended executions for witchcraft in 17... 35. Massachusetts Bay Colony would apologize for the episode a few years after it took place, but this is one of the things that eventually leads to the rise of what we know as the Yankee. So, let's look a little more detail here. The background to the events of the Salem Witch Scare is extremely important to understanding why this took place uh, in the first place. For two decades before the events that of the witch trials, New England had been in the grip of severe social stresses. Uh, in 1675, a conflict with the Native Americans known as King Philip's War resulted in more deaths relative to the size of po the population than any other war in American history. Uh, a decade later, in 1685, King James II revoked the Massachusetts Charter and created the Dominion of New England and appointed a governor, Sir Edmund Andros. It combined New York, New Jersey, uh, and Massachusetts and of course parts of what we know today as uh, New Hampshire and Vermont and Maine into one particular uh, section. Um, they restricted town meetings, they imposed direct control over militia appointments, they permitted the first public celebration of Christmas, which was actually against Puritan types of law. But William the uh, Third, sorry, replaced James the Second. William the Third replaced James the Second as King of England in 1689. Andros was overthrown, but Massachusetts still was required to eliminate the religious qualification for voting, which they had before, uh, and then also to uh, tolerate new groups of people like the wacky Quakers, which they're not that wacky; they're just extreme pacifists. And then you also have. Uh, a sudden increase in slaves in New England. In 1637, the Pequot War produced the first known slaves in New England. While many Indian men were transported into slavery in the West Indies, many Indian women and children were used as household slaves in New England. In 1641, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties recognized perpetual and hereditary servitude, <clears throat> um, although there is they do kind of go back and forth on this a little bit. But one slave in particular, her name was Tichiba, was a part of the growing number of slaves that were being imported from the West Indies. You also have complex social roots going on here. It drew upon pre-existing rivalries and disputes with rapidly growing Massachusetts port town, uh, being Salem, that's really what it was, is a port town. You had families that had squabbled for generations over which land belonged to which of them by different rights, by different inheritance, uh, people who'd purchased lands, uh, surveys were not done properly, all sorts of different things were going on there. Uh, it provided ample opportunity for people to take revenge once this witchcraft scare started up. They'd accuse others in order to get the land back, quote-unquote. They weren't even sure if it was theirs in the first place, but they thought it was, so that allowed them to be able to purchase the land back if the person was executed for witchcraft. Um, additionally, you have the good, hard, holy work of farming, which was supposed to show God's grace. If you were a good person uh, and you were predestined to be one of those people who went to heaven, then, because that's what the Puritans believed, then you would also be shown with a good crop. However, that was starting to change because it was upending Puritan society. Merchants were becoming increasingly wealthy in Puritan life, and uh, they didn't seem to be working, at least not as much as... Uh, the other Puritans were. So that caused a lot of religious conflict because you had people who weren't working hard were suddenly becoming wealthy. How's that working out for, for that? And then you also had uh, a new group of people that were becoming wealthy who were not landowners, which was kind of upending a lot of tensions and bringing up a lot of tensions in the 
uh, religious Puritan community as well. The witch trials kind of offer a window into the anxieties and social tensions that accompanied New England's increasingly uh, integrated Atlantic economy. Now, there are conflicting reports of what actually happened to set off the witch scare. Most historians seem to point to the uh, woman Tichiba, the slave Tichiba, making a witch cake of rye meal and urine to help counteract symptoms of uh, some girls that were convulsing and choking uh, in particular. Other stories have been passed down that the girls uh, convinced Tichiba to play some of her magic games, uh, normally which involved some degree of fortune telling. One girl saw something that may have foretold her death and that sent her into a state of hysteria. Now the problem is they could not actually say, well, this is what we did and they couldn't talk to their parents about it because what they did was highly illegal at the time. So they had to keep it a secret, and then next thing you know, it's coming out. Now here's the interesting part. Of the 19 people, in ex uh, of 19 people executed and dozens and dozens accused for witchcraft in Salem, none of them were actually witches. Some of them may have practiced some sort of folk, uh, form of folk medicine uh, from time to time, but not witchcraft like you would think of it today. The irony is, though, is that there's hundreds of people in Salem who openly practice some sort of witchcraft or Wiccan type of belief, and you can find all sorts of Wiccan shops and occult shops all over the city today. They actually fully embrace this type of thing. So it's, uh, it's kind of cool. <clears throat> Now, the Salem Witch Trials were not a unique event. In continental Europe, the witch hunts uh, were much more common than in America. Thousands of people were executed, uh, often isolated and impoverished older women who were regarded as a drain on community resources and an easy person to blame if things went wrong. Mid midwives were also an easy person to blame, too. Uh, obviously, the child died because you were a bad midwife or therefore a witch or something like that is one of the things that uh, would be often, to often tossed out. And it's not like it just stopped in the 17, in 1700 either. Uh, as late as 1787, outside of Independence Hall, which you see here, this is while the framers were drafting the U.S. Constitution. A Philadelphia mob killed an accused witch. In the half century before the Salem Witch Trials, more than 80 people were put on trial for witchcraft in Massachusetts and Connecticut. During the 17th century, some 32 people were executed for witchcraft in the American colonies. What was unique about the Salem Witch Trials was the number of people who were accused and convicted. Previous witch trials, the judge had high standards of proof, which resulted in most people being acquitted. But with the changes in the government, with England revoking the charter, the judicial, judicial system was basically tossed out the window, and then they were expected to replace it but there was not enough time and they just hadn't gotten around to it. So the special court that had been set up allowed the use of spectral evidence, testimony from people who had visions or dreams that somebody was tormenting them. Uh, the court also permitted the use of psychological pressure and even torture to obtain a confession and ruled that anyone who confessed uh, was, would be allowed to go free as long as they identified uh, potential witches, witches too. You couldn't just confess and then you get to go free. You'd also have to say who else was there. And oftentimes uh, some people would refuse to actually name anybody else. They would say, yes, I did it. It was me. And then that was it. For the educated Puritan elite, however, there's some sort of double irony in the fact that the witch scare erupted in Salem because Salem means peace. And the town, fo town founders had actually hoped that Salem would be a village of peace, an example uh, they had drawn the word Salem from Jerusalem, hoping that the new village would serve as a foundation uh, for what they envisioned to be a new Jerusalem. <clears throat> 